I'm Udo Sektem from Stuttgart in Germany, and um, this is Professor Bax. We both work in the committee, the guideline committee of the ESC. He's the chairman, I'm a member, and I have the privilege of uh, having a brief interview with my chairman about the ESC guidelines. Um, Jerome, the ESC guidelines have increased in popularity over the past years. How do you explain that? Well, thank you, Udo, uh, for the uh, for the questions. I think indeed uh, the ESC guidelines have substantially increased in popularity uh, rapidly over the over the past years. And uh, well, one of the things that we should acknowledge to that is uh, the leadership of Alec Vanyan. He was actually the chair before I uh, uh, started with this uh, with this process, and Alec has uh, built a fantastic uh, program. Uh, on how these things are produced. So uh, there is a systematic approach to, uh, to every guideline and uh, the topics are well thought of, uh, very clinically relevant topics and um, it's a very uh, um, specific process that's being done. So it takes a lot of time to gather all the information, large groups being uh, put together and actually I think the combination of a very specific uh, way of preparing the things in addition to uh, getting all the evidence, looking specifically at all the details, in combination with the topics that are so popular that has resulted into a lot of attention. Uh, also, I think the ESC has reached out not only to the uh, main European countries, but also now on a much more global scale. So the guidelines have a much bigger dissemination on a global scale, and I think that has resulted in increasing popularity. So one, perfect leadership of Alec Van Jan with his system that he put into place. Two, the topics that are being chosen, and three, I think the uh, the global atmosphere that we are uh, engaged in now. Well, I think you're a little bit too modest about your own role. Um, what I also hear is that the ESC guidelines are a little bit more practical, shorter, more applicable than the US guidelines. Is, is that also one of your goals? Well, I think the goal of guidelines is, is on the one hand that it should be precise and following all the evidence, but on the other hand, uh, the doctors on the daily practice should be able to implement and work with the information. So indeed, a careful balance between evidence-based medicine uh, on which the recommendations are built on and then on the other hand the um, the practicality that balance is crucial when you prepare guidelines and I think um, for a lot of uh, specific topics there is not large randomized controlled trials and there you need to be practical and give recommendations that fit with the daily practice and I think there is a lot of uh, interest uh, and a lot of investment in making that very practical so that it's applicable in the daily routine. Well, such a complicated um, process of producing a high quality a product um, needs a little bit of explanation. Could you summarize for us briefly how the process works in producing such a guideline? Sure, sure. sure. That is, I think that is a real uh, key important issue in this field. What is, uh, what is important is to realize that once a guideline is started, it takes about one and a half to two years before the publication is there. So uh, first, a task force chair is selected by the guidelines uh, committee and that has to be approved within certain bodies and then the chair is uh, appointed. And once the chair is appointed, uh, usually the team is then built out of 20 to 25 experts in this field, uh, ranging from epidemiology to pharmacology to the specific uh, uh, needs for that guideline. So it's a big team, 20, 25 people, who then work with uh, each other for, let's say, a period of about one plus year. Based on all the evidence that's then gathered from the, uh, from the literature, meta-analysis are being done and the recommendations are being put in place. And I think um, what is then important is then the review process starts and we have uh, an independent review committee which is absolutely in no means uh, related to the uh, writing committee and that ensures a complete objective evaluation 
of each guideline. Now there are three rounds usually of reviewing, round one, two, three, and only then thereafter uh, the specific guideline is released and sent in for publication. So you can see that the whole process really spreads out over about one year of writing and one year of reviewing and rewriting and adapting. Now to give you a bit more insight, actually what happened is that we ended up with so many reviewers over the last couple of years that we came actually into a problem. So let's say the victim of our own success because what happened is that we ended up with more than 2,000 comments by the reviewers per round of review. So then it became a bit of an impractical situation. So what we're doing now is reducing a bit the number of reviewers, but going more into focused reviews that we have specific people that review a specific part of a specific guideline, which are really expert in that specific field, and thereby reducing the comments a bit. But it gives you an idea, if you speak about several thousands of comments and then three rounds of review, how much time that costs. One, getting the information, takes long time, meta-analysis, epidemiologists working with us, getting the information, building the recommendations. Two, actually the review process. So your question, how long does it take, what's the procedure, this is it. Well, when you talk about um, effort and time, um, can we also talk about money? I mean, that sounds very expensive. What, what is the average budget for such a guideline? There is an average budget uh, per guideline, and I don't know exactly how much is being put in uh, per guideline, but there is a substantial amount of money available for building the guideline, uh, but also the products that are being uh, taken from this guideline, which are the pocket guidelines, the slide that are being put on the web that is available to everybody, and a sort of essential messages, which are summarized also on the website. So there is a budget per guideline, and it varies also a little bit with what sort of topic it is, and whether it's a joint guideline or it's a pure ESC guideline, because we have also joint guidelines with the uh, European Association of uh, Diabetes, for example, with the uh, surgeons, and um, these joint guidelines actually call for a bit more investment than the uh, pure ESC guidelines. Now, the implementation of guidelines is very important, and that is, of course, the area where the national societies are involved. Uh, how do you involve the national societies so that they feel it is their guideline? Very important topic, because I think we should never forget that the guidelines are written for the end users. It's the end users, the daily cardiologist, the one that is actively working in the field. He needs to be able to work with this information. So if the national societies don't support, you don't come to the level of implementation and endorsement. So we've really reached out over the years uh, to the national societies building the uh, mutual interest in the topic. And we started with getting the guidelines endorsed in the different countries, which is now uh, growing very rapidly. Almost 70% of the uh, national societies involved are endorsing and actively implementing uh, the guidelines into their daily practice on a national basis. So we work with them quite intensively. And another thing is that we have annual or biannual meetings where they are constantly updated on the new guidelines that are coming and they're actively involved in uh, the review process, also to some extent in the writing process, and that results in better implementation um, and actively uh, increasing the practice uh, involving the guidelines. Well, Professor Bax, thank you very much for this interview and all the best for your future guidelines. Thank you very much.